Hello class, it's Professor Streeter. I wanted to return to the slideshow from this week, the second half of the slideshow. Before I do, I wanted to draw the fundamental distinction that we've been focusing on this week. The distinction between subjective and objective accounts of welfare or well-being. What does that distinction really come down to? Well, here's one way to think about it. For the subjectivist, and Heathwood is an example of someone who defends a subjective approach to well-being, my life is going well for me, um, provided I am satisfying my desires, whatever they happen to be. So my welfare consists in the satisfaction of my desires. Whereas the objectivist wants to say, that my welfare or my, my life is, is going well to the degree that I am satisfying desires for things that are worthy of my desire, right? that are worth desiring, right? which suggests that the measure of welfare is not just my desiring something and my satisfying that desire, but that I desire the right kinds of things, or I desire things that are worth desiring. Okay? And then everything for the objectivist would come down to explaining, well, What's the difference between things that are worth desiring and things that aren't worth desiring? And why should that make a difference to my welfare or my well-being? Okay, well, you know, you could think of an example, example of somebody who um, desires to count every single object in her house. Now, let's say she embarks on the project of counting every single object in her house and succeeds, now she's satisfied desire to count every single object in her house for no purpose, just because it seems like a thing to do. Um, the subjectivist would say as long as that desire doesn't undermine other desires of hers, that satisfying that desire benefits her, right? contributes to her welfare, it makes her life better. Why? Because it was a desire of hers and now it's been satisfied. <clears throat> Okay, that's a view. The objectivist kind of would raise a question there. Well, in what way is that project something worth pursuing? Right? Why is it worth spending your time counting every object in your house? Perhaps there's an answer to that question. But if there's not an answer to that question, the objectivist would say that that's not something worth desiring. So just the fact that I satisfied that desire doesn't show that I have increased my welfare or improved the quality of my life or made my life better in any measurable way, right? Unless the desire to count every object in my house, right, can be explained as part of some larger project that contributes some good to my life, just the satisfying that desire doesn't all by itself um, benefit me, the objectivist would say. Why? Because it's not something worth desiring. And so again, the objectivist has a way of explaining that difference and why that difference matters. Okay. So um, we'll come back to that thought, but that's just, I wanted to sort of open there. Um, whoops. What's going on? All right. I gotta stop this video. This is totally annoying. <laughs> well, I can't seem to uh, manipulate things on my screen, so that's very frustrating. Ah, okay. Here I am. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go back down to the bottom of the screen. Sorry about that. I'm having some technical difficulties. And here we are with the, um, the slideshow. Okay, there you got to see me getting annoyed at technology. All right. So <clears throat> here's a way of thinking about Heathwood's thesis. Sorry. So we'll come back to that point I was just making about a objective and subjective accounts of welfare. I hope that helps frame the, the conversation. Um, here's a way of thinking about Heathwood's thesis, right? That desire satisfaction is what our welfare consists in. There's two components to that thesis, and Schaefer-Landau breaks them down for you. 
in chapter um, four. Um, sorry, chapter uh, yeah, chapter chapter four. One is what's called the necessity condition, right? <clears throat> that the subjectivist is committed to the view that in order to promote my own good, in order to make my life better, I have to satisfy some desire of mine. It's necessary. Right? If something is intrinsically good for us, then it fulfills our desires. If something is instrumentally good for us, then it helps us to fill, fulfill our desires. Right? That's another way of putting the point. To say that something has value for me is to say that it fulfills a desire or is a way of helping me fulfill a desire. Why? Because the only way to promote my good or promote my welfare is by satisfying a desire. Right? Heathwood is committed to that claim. Ask yourself if that's true. Ask yourself if there are examples where you make your life better, you promote your good, you promote your self-interest without satisfying any particular desire you have. Right? Uh, Schaefer Landau gives a, an example of a way that that might happen. Uh, he, call, he calls them pleasant surprises. Right? When you are surprised by friends with a party for your birthday and you weren't expecting it or desiring it, right? the party might make your life better. Uh, it, you know, the surprise party might might promote your good, um, even though you didn't desire it. It didn't satisfy any particular desire of yours because it was a surprise, right? That's a kind of simple example, but there are lots of things like that where the world pleasantly surprises us and, right, you know, shows us something good that improves our lives, but something that, they, that we didn't already desire. It instills maybe new desires in us, but that's not a way of satisfying an existing desire, right? So sometimes your welfare can be promoted without satisfying a desire. Um, that's a potential problem, right, for the view. Uh, Heathwood is also committed to the sufficiency condition, the idea that it's, it, in order to promote your good, it's enough or sufficient that you satisfy some desire. Okay, and here's again Schaefer Landau's gloss on that. If something fulfills our desires, then it's intrinsically good for us. And if something helps to fulfill our desires, then it's instrumentally good for us. Right? That's the, the claim that Heathwood is committed to, according to Schaefer Landau. Another way of putting it is, right, all that I have to do to promote my own good is satisfy some desire of mine. That's enough. That's sufficient. Again, is that is that true? Um, he, he, Heathwood uh, sorry, Schaefer Landau discusses in chapter four some reasons for thinking that the sufficiency condition might not be true, might not hold. Right? He gives the example of um, of desires based on false beliefs, for example. Right? If my desire um, um, to uh, you know hang out with my my, my beloved is satisfied. <clears throat> but it's based on a false belief that my beloved loves me, um, then it's not clear that spending time with someone who doesn't love me actually makes my life better, even though it satisfies a desire of mine. Right? So I mean, you can think of other examples where because our beliefs are false right, and misleading, that we end up satisfying desires for things that actually might harm us. So there are a variety of ways in which you might argue that the sufficiency condition doesn't hold, that it's not enough just that I satisfy a desire, right? That's not enough to show that I've promoted my good or made my life better, okay? Um, so anyway, <clears throat> coming back to this debate then about this between subjectivists and objectivists, right? The subjectivist believes that when I think about the goodness of my life, right, that can be measured in ways that come apart from or are distinct from this sort of question of welfare. Right? The question of like what makes my life better for me is distinct, um, Heathwood thinks, from the question of sort of what objectively makes my life better. Right? So what makes a person's life fair or go well depends on my attitudes, my beliefs and desires, my felt experiences. Whereas what makes a person's life good, right, in a more objective sense, like virtuous, what makes me a virtuous or courageous person, may be independent of my beliefs and desires and felt experiences, right, uh, and and it might not benefit me, right? <clears throat> right, being virtuous might not benefit me. It may benefit other people, but not, might not benefit me. So this is the kind of starting point for Heathwood that 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 there seems to be something about well-being 
that depends on a person's attitudes and experiences in a way that, let, let's say, morality doesn't seem to. Um, and so that's the kind of distinction he draws here. Um, okay, we talked about this in class. Think about examples uh, of ways in which morality doesn't depend on people's attitudes. That something can be right or wrong no matter what people believe or feel or desire. Whereas, you know, the way we think about welfare may be more subjective. It depends on the individual's feelings and wants. Right? So think about examples of subjective qualities and, and examples of objective qualities as, as you work through this. Um, you know, take, think about jokes. Are jokes objectively funny? Right? Is a joke funny whether or not people laugh at it? Right? Suppose you, you tell a joke uh, to an audience and nobody laughs. Right? Does that show that they missed something or that your joke just wasn't funny or a little bit of both, right? You might think that, you know, some audiences just miss the joke. Right? The joke is funny. Right? There's qualities of the joke that make it funny. Usually, under normal circumstances, that would provoke laughter in people. But maybe you could argue some jokes are funny even if other people don't laugh at them. But that starts to sound like an odd view, right? So many would argue that, look, whether a joke is funny or not is a, is a merely subjective quality. It depends entirely on people's attitudes. Like if people don't laugh at the joke, that shows that it's not funny because what makes a joke funny is that people laugh at it. Right? Um, the objectivist would respond, well, no, there are ways of talking about jokes. And like, you know, what is it about the joke that makes it funny independently of what people uh, find in it or independently of whether people laugh at it? Okay, so you can think about different qualities and, and whether they are more subjective or more objective. Um, right? Heathwood is committed to the view that welfare is subjective. It's more like, um, you know, whether something tastes good, right? Whether something tastes good, you know, like a, is certainly a, a subjective quality, right? Um, uh, so the tastiness of a cheeseburger depends on well, subjective facts about me. There's no objective fact about whether cheeseburgers are tasty. Similarly, he wants to say whether something benefits me or not depends on my desires. It depends on subjective facts about me. Right? There's no objective measure of what benefits me or what you know makes my life better. Um, by contrast, right, and 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 Schaefer Landau will agree that 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 morality, whether something is right or wrong, uh, does not depend on my attitude toward it. Okay, um, so we've talked about this. And uh, in the context of, of Heathwood, <clears throat> think about whether you can come up with examples of subjective and objective qualities and then ask yourself, is Heathwood right about welfare? Is it more like qualities that we think of as subjective, like, you know, the tastiness of a cheeseburger or the funniness of a joke? Or is it more like objective qualities, like the rightness of an action or, um, I don't know, the, the mathematical qualities like the, the shape of a of a, the shape of an object right an object is square even if it doesn't look square to me like there's a, an objective fact about what the shape of an object is welfare more like a subjective quality or more like an objective quality right um so um hooker comes in here right he's going to defend what he calls an objective theory of well-being um, and it's in some ways a, a kind of, uh, we can think of this in response to the, the objections that Heathwood considers at the end of his essay, right? Um, um, you know, there are, if, if you think that the satisfaction of a desire is both necessary and sufficient to promote your good, well, what about confused and ignorant thinking or, or false beliefs? This is something that comes up in Schaefer Landau. It comes up here at the end of Heathwood's article. Right? Like, like I, I want to eat something that will uh, cause me to get really sick, like the cherry pie. Um, or I, wanna, I, want, I have a desire to do something that will uh, cause me lots of stress and cause me lots of pain, un unbeknownst to me. Um, well, let's say I satisfy those desires. On Heathwood's account, it looks like I've made my life better. Right? But since my, my beliefs were ignorant or confused, and I ended up doing something that actually harmed me, you know, I've satisfied a desire, but it, it, it doesn't make my life better. It seems to make my life worse. Okay. And so that's another kind of example of I, I desire something that's not worth desiring, right? Or that I shouldn't desire. And the subjectivist doesn't really have a way of explaining why that doesn't, uh, why that doesn't promote my own good or why that undermines my welfare. Um, 
he does turn to this question of net desires. He thinks, look, 